no problem. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, we are live. Hello. It is my pleasure to be here. I am Athena Actipus, and today I'm going to talk about fermenting for the zombie apocalypse, two of my favorite topics, fermenting and the zombie apocalypse. And um, I'm going to use this as a way of also talking a little bit about how microbes cooperate with each other um, to create public goods and also protect the um, in this case, fermented foods from pathogens that can potentially invade. I'm a professor at ASU in the Department of Psychology. I'm also the director of the Interdisciplinary Cooperation Initiative at ASU. Um, and my perhaps the thing I'm most proud of is that I'm the chair of the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Alliance, which is a interdisciplinary group of people that uses science and humanities and interdisciplinary research to um, basically look at what are the challenges we're facing now and what are the challenges we're going to be facing in the future um, through the lens of the zombie apocalypse. So it's um, super fun and exciting and um, I find it a, a great creative way to talk about science and the arts and um, really to think about our, our futures. Hmm, my slides are not advancing, just a moment. Hmm, of course, technical problems here. Well. Hmm, are you clicking or are you? I am arrowing? advancing the arrows. Hmm. I'm trying, I'm gonna try clicking here, see if that works. There we go. All right. Perfect. Worked. Um, so in addition to my role at ASU, I also um, write books and I'm a podcaster. So I have a podcast called Zombified, which is really about all these things that manipulate us without us realizing it. And we also use it as um, use the whole idea of zombification and the zombie apocalypse as a way of looking at things from an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so if you're uh, if you like podcasts, um, definitely check out Zombified. And um, in my work in my lab, we look at cooperation across lots of different systems. And I work on how humans cooperate. So we have field sites around the world where we look at human cooperation. We look at cooperation in the lab. Um, I'm also a computational modeler. So I make computer models of cooperation to see what makes cooperation viable or not. Um, I also look at cancer um, and the human body as a cooperative system where you can have cheating. And then of course, um, most central to the topic of fermentation um, and also human interactions with fermented foods. I, am, I have a whole um, wing of my research looking at microbe-microbe cooperation um, in particular in kombucha and also looking at host microbe cooperation. So how does our microbiome interact with us as hosts? And when is that characterized by cooperation? Um, you know, where microbes are helping us do things that we need to do to survive and thrive. And when is it actually characterized by conflict where microbes might have um, fitness interests that are not the same as ours. Now, let's return for a moment to this bigger question of um, the zombie apocalypse. So I want you to imagine that zombie apocalypse has happened and you have to figure out now what you're going to take with you. Um, maybe, you know, you've got a, a Z team, you've got your people, but you got to figure out what are you going to take along with you. Now, I um, would take with me my family, of course. Let me introduce you to um, my microbial family here. So I've got my um, kombucha and my um, sourdough starter. It's kind of hanging out in the back there. Um, I've got yogurt. I've got um, sour cream and some um, fermented vegetables. There's some radishes. Um, I love fermenting. Um, not just because it's tasty, but I also find it really 
relaxing to do it. And um, I actually started doing research on kombucha because I really like the taste of kombucha and I brought kombucha into my home and um, then I kind of got fascinated by it. Um, but let's return back to why um, would we, or why would I <laughs> take um, all of these fermented foods with me in the zombie apocalypse? Well, one of the challenges in a zombie apocalypse, you know, you have potentially some sort of agent of zombification that could be uh, infectious disease, right? It might be a microbe of some sort that is a pathogen. Um, and if it's an apocalypse, there might also be damage to the infrastructure, right? So the challenge of even just getting safe water to drink or of um, finding food sources and, and making sure that those are safe, um, having a robust microbial culture um, can potentially help with those challenges of the zombie apocalypse. So here is um, my uh, first fermented um, project. Um, this is my kombucha um, sitting um, where it was in my kitchen. Um, and like I mentioned before, I started um, fermenting because uh, I've found kombucha to be really delicious. And, um, and I did some looking up online and realized it was actually pretty easy to ferment it yourself. So I set up um, a culture in my kitchen. Um, but Soon after I set it up, I just started wondering, like, what is happening in there? I would, you know, come home from work and have a little kombucha and, you know, sit at the kitchen table with my, um, my kombucha and just wonder, you know, what's in there? What's happening? Why are these bubbles um, rising? And so I, I started looking at, you know, what was known about kombucha. And this was about five years ago um, when there was very, very little work on fermented foods in general and kombucha in particular, and um, realized that there was not really very much um, work looking at what the composition of kombucha was, how the different components, different microbial components are interacting to ferment it. And so um, I took some of this kombucha into my lab and um, we started doing research on kombucha. So um, we you know, brought in, uh, I brought in my SCOBY, one of my SCOBYs from the top, um, an extra one that had accumulated and some of the starter. And once we brought it into the lab, we had to have a strict rule that nobody could drink it because um, once you bring something you know, from your home kitchen into the lab, now it falls under all these sort of requirements of doing research in the university. So um, after we brought it in, we couldn't drink it, but that's okay. I still you know, have mine at home, um, but we were able to start looking at some questions. So our, the first thing that we did was look at what are some of the best practices for how to grow kombucha in the lab? And um, so we, we published a paper, it's now in um, Pier J if you're interested in this, but I'm um, basically looking at how you can actually grow kombucha in a reliable way in the lab um, by um, starting with just the starter and not with a SCOBY because it allows for um, having a more sort of uniform um, set of um, replicates if you're looking at specific questions. And we've also been looking at how in kombucha you have multi-species cooperation. And um, in particular, and I think of special interest for the zombie apocalypse is, you know, how does kombucha keep pathogens out? How does kombucha keep microbes from growing in there that we don't want? And that also might not be good for the kombucha. So Part of our review uh, a couple of years ago when we started looking at um, kombucha was really to get a sense of what are the metabolic stages of so what's happening as kombucha is um, is brewing. So um, the way that you start kombucha is really with sweet tea. So you have tea and, and table sugar, basically. Um, and then you have a little bit of starter, usually between 10 and 20% starter, which is just kombucha. So you put those together. And then in that starter, you have yeast and bacteria that together um, break up the sucrose in the table sugar. And um, the yeast breaks that up. And then the bacteria process the glucose and fructose to make the cellulose to make gluconic acid, to make acetic acid. Um, and together they create really what is this um, 
bubbly, delicious fermented tea that we all know as kombucha. And we can also sort of take this framework of cooperation and competition to examine what's happening in this process as um, the kombucha is, is brewing with the help of the yeast and bacteria. So we can think of invertase, which is um, essentially a, a little um, enzyme that cuts the sucrose up into the glucose and the fructose. Um, that's really a, a public good because it makes it possible for the yeast and for the bacteria to process those sugars. So, um, so that's one clear example of cooperation that's happening in kombucha. Um, then there's um, waste removal and um, interaction that's happening between the bacteria and yeast to um, process the resources that are there. So that's another example of cooperation. And um, we also suspect that part of what's happening with the cellulose, with the SCOBY on top, um, is resource storage um, because that cellulose is actually um, sort of very densely, densely packed carbon. Um, and uh, we have seen at least um, anecdotally that oftentimes the cellulose will, um, the SCOBYs will break down after a long period of time of not feeding the, um, the kombucha. So, um, so we suspect that that might actually be functioning as resource storage, um, which again is a potentially cooperative aspect of kombucha. Now there's also competition um, and we think that competition might actually be helping to keep out those um, invaders that are not wanted, those pathogens that could have a negative effect on the kombucha um, and also potentially on human health. And um, there's production of acids and ethanol and CO2 um, and, and all of those may be inhibiting um, microbes that are sort of not desired. Um, and then also the SCOBY um, creates a physical barrier um, that keeps um, microbes from sort of entering through the air. And it also may be blocking access to oxygen for some of the microbes underneath, um, which could be also affecting which microbes can and can't grow in the kombucha as easily. So, we can kind of look at this in, in this table um, where as we go down in the table, these are the different sort of stages of what's happening in kombucha. And um, what we see is that there's both competitive elements and cooperative elements that occur um, at each of these stages. And in terms of the human uses, you know, we have here some, some ways that um, kombucha could potentially be helpful in a zombie apocalypse. Um, we know that, um, that acids and alcohol are antiseptic um, and the biofilm that's produced um, can potentially be helping to protect from invading pathogens. Um, it also could be used as a biomaterial. Um, there are actually some bandages that are made out of um, scobies. So, you know, in the case of the zombie apocalypse, um, you could potentially make really good use of um, your kombucha culture if you have one. So let me show you what we have done in terms of engaging with the public with kombucha and actually using that engagement with the public um, to address some of these questions that we have about the ability of kombucha to protect from um, invading pathogens. This is a set of videos from a public event that we had in 2017. We had people swab their hands and then put those swabs into containers either of kombucha or containers that had sweet tea with no kombucha. And the initial starting condition for um, kombucha was 80% uh, kombucha and 20% I'm sorry, 80% sweet tea, 20% kombucha. Um, and for just the sweet tea, was 100% sweet tea. So those um, hand swabs went in both. And then we looked um, over 10 days at what happened to um, those beakers 
And here's what we saw the sweet tea. So this is with no kombucha in it. This is just the sweet tea with the hand swabs in it. Disgusting. The kombucha. Now, for those of you who brew kombucha or have seen kombucha brewing, you'll know that this is a very healthy looking SCOBY. And we see no evidence of um, contamination by mold or um, any other uh, things that could compromise the kombucha. So what this suggests to us is that um, the community, the microbial community in the kombucha is somehow able to um, suppress all of these other microbes um, that might otherwise be making use of the sugar in the sweet tea. Um, and it, it's able to um, basically maintain this population of microbes um, from the initial um, inoculation with the kombucha, even though lots and lots of hand swabs went into that from the general public. And what we also found is that when we looked at the microbial composition, um, that there was a dramatic shift in the yeast and bacterial profile of the sweet tea from the beginning of the um, uh, experiment until the end. But for the kombucha, there was a very stable profile of yeast and bacteria. And um, I apologize, this is not the easiest to read figure, but um, you can see here, if you look at the bacteria, we have the first four bars are the kombucha in day one, and the next four bars are kombucha in day 30. You can see they look very, very similar. So this is basically showing that a kombucha maintained a very, very similar population of microbes um, between day one and day 30. Now, the second half, um, you see the T in day one and the T in day 30. And you see a, a dramatic shift from day one to day 30, um, in particular, um, that there are enterobacteria colonizing the tea. Um, and those are those green bars. And um, those are microbes that we really don't want. Um, so not only um, is there a, um, a, a large shift in the, just the tea, but it's um, bacteria that, that are um, not good for humans. And so what this suggests to us is that the kombucha is able to really maintain the stable population despite all of um, this sort of inoculation uh, um, with microbes from the outside world. We look, can look at the um, yeast too, the fungi here. And um, you see again, the kombucha day one versus the kombucha day 30, very, very similar, very stable profiles. Um, and then um, T day one to T day 30, a dramatic shift. Now we have a pathogenic fungus, Oreo um, basidium, dominating the T later on. So um, this is evidence that the bacterial profile is changing, um, the fungal profile is changing in the T, um, but not so much in the kombucha, that something about the kombucha is allowing for that to um, stay stable. We did a very similar experiment during um, the 2018 Night of the Open Door event at ASU. And um, what we saw again was that the um, kombucha was, um, uh, was maintaining a, um, a, a very kombucha-like phenotype, right? It looked very much like kombucha um, and the tea got, got really gross. Um, and the, you know, even when the kombucha had the hand swabs, it was still, um, still looked very similar. And, um, and here, I just wanna call your attention to another thing that we did in this study, um, we looked at the kombucha with hand swabs and without hand swabs. And the reason we did this is because we suspected that maybe part of what was going on with the hand swabs um, is that it was actually generating an even more robust SCOBY than we saw without the hand swabs. And, and, and this really just came from our observations from earlier studies because um, we were really surprised at how healthy and robust the um, SCOBYs looked on the top. And so when we did this um, study, we in, for the 2018 Night of the Open Door, we included a sort of additional control where we had kombucha without any hand swabs going in it. And 
you can see that when we put the hand swabs in, that actually produced a much thicker biofilm than when we didn't put the hand swabs in. And the way that we're starting to think about this is that this um, SCOBY and some of the, the other elements of the kombucha might actually um, resemble a sort of immune system, but for this multi-species community. And so when these pathogens are introduced through the hand swabs, it may be that there's a more robust response to try to create a physical barrier um, that will protect the kombucha from invasion. And, and so we're looking at this hypothesis with, with these kinds of studies. Um, and we're also um, varying the initial amount of kombucha that goes in. Um, uh, and uh, we're seeing that when you actually put a smaller amount of kombucha in at the beginning, sometimes you get a very large biofilm, which is sort of counterintuitive if you think that it's sort of just a linear relationship between how many microbes go in and how big the biofilm is. But if it is really part of the sort of defense system, um, then that observation makes a little more sense. So this is a, a question we're actively looking at right now in my lab. Now um, let's uh, let's back up a little bit to the big picture here, um, and you know, want to ask you again, sort of, what would you take with you in the zombie apocalypse? I would take with me um, my microbial cultures, these multi-species microbial ecosystems um, that could potentially have many uses in terms of um, protecting us from pathogens and um, maybe even helping us to deal with wounds that we might um, get from zombies. So that's how, how I would approach um, the zombie apocalypse. Now, I have a, a whole other set of work around zombies and the zombie apocalypse. And um, I want to invite all of you to um, join us. We have a, a meeting um, coming up in October called the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Meeting. And it's actually launching um, as an online television channel called Channel Z. So it's going to be a sort of hybrid between a um, parody television channel about the zombie apocalypse and an academic meeting. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, you can find us at zombiemed.org. And um, I'll also be tweeting about it over the next week or two. We're going to be opening up abstract submissions. Um, and it would be um, wonderful to have any of you who are working on fermentation submit um, proposals for talks or sessions, because we um, definitely see fermentation as an important part of surviving and thriving in the zombie apocalypse. And we'll also have a lot of content that will be available for general audiences as well. So um, you can find all of that at zombiemed.org over the next few weeks. And um, yes, yeah, so we'll be launching Channel Z in October 2020. And I hope that we will see a lot of you there. I want to thank um, my lab and all of the funding agencies that have supported us, um, and especially Alex May, um, Sri Narayanan, and um, Giselle Marquez, who have done a lot of the work in the lab, um, and um, many of my colleagues who have been um, collaborating on looking at kombucha together for many years. And, and thank you to all of you for your time and attention and um, sharing your brains. It was my pleasure to share my brains with all of you this afternoon. Yay! <laughs> just me too, but I'm clapping on behalf of the 150 or so people who are joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Athena. I have a few questions from the YouTube chat, if you've got time. Sure. Okay, the first one was, well, the second one, which I'm going to start with first, had to do with your experiment with the tea and the kombucha and the, the participants who um, helped you with that. Were you able to get that information back to them, the people who swabbed their hands? 
Yeah, so um, when people swabbed their hands, they we gave them a card that had information about our um, our lab Twitter account, the Actipus Lab, and we actually posted pictures over the coming weeks about um, how each of the kombuchas were looking, and um, and we also um, posted a blog post about sort of what is kombucha, so that we could kind of keep that um, communication with the public open. Awesome. That question came from mostly microbes as well. So awesome. these, these are your people. Uh, my second question here uh, was um, about the critters. We've got microbially speaking. What's the main difference between the critters and kombucha versus water kefir versus ginger bug? Um, so in my microbial family at the moment, I don't have any kefir and what was the other one ginger ginger bug i don't i also don't have that or know what that is but i can say that um kombucha is very different from the um fermentations that are more sort of based on dairy products um kombucha doesn't have lactobacillus in it and lactobacillus is um usually the dominant microbe in um any dairy based um fermentation so um like my yogurt it doesn't like my kombucha like i don't mix them they're not not the same microbial populations um but I will confess that the way that I started my sourdough um, was with an inoculation from my kombucha. And then, of course, you know, whatever else landed in it, um, then, you know, populated it as well. But that's how I initially started my sourdough. Oh, there's an idea for everybody. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And um, it actually, in the early stages before it matured, it made the best pizza dough I've ever had. So you know, if you're, if you're looking to make some quick and easy pizza dough, I think a little kombucha with, you know, your typical uh, uh, pizza dough components, pretty good. Huh. Pretty good approach, so. Something to try over the weekend. The long yeah. Week. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Athena, thank you again so much for lending your expertise with us this afternoon. Uh, I just have a few quick notes for everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody who has participated in the survey I sent out earlier in the week, just asking you about how this time still works for you, how we're doing with this uh, series. I really appreciate all of your feedback, the good, the bad, the ugly. Thank you. Keep it coming in. I'm going to actually put a link to that survey um, in the YouTube chat right now. If you haven't had a chance to go take it, please do. We love to know how we're doing and what we can improve. Um, also want to tell you that there are some schedule changes coming up in the fermentology series. Next week's talk is gonna be shifted to sometime in the spring and some other talks are moving around as well. So I can't actually tell you what the next talk is going to be or when yet, but rest assured in July, we'll be carrying on with the series and talking more about fermented goodies. Um, otherwise, again, on behalf of the 150-ish people here, Athena, thank you so much again and looking forward to seeing you guys probably in two weeks time. Thanks a lot.